I am Ken Wong, Senior Director of Product Management at Databricks. Very excited to be here and to share a few thoughts on why data engineers are key to the AI revolution. You know, a lot of superlatives have been applied to the rise of data and AI. Personally, I've been in the data space for roughly two decades, and each year I, I think, wow, this was the biggest year yet. But the last 12 months really have been different. The rise of Gen AI and the awareness now in the broader public about what's possible have changed things. And of course, the pace at which all of this technology has advanced has been really incredible. But I think even more than the pace of progress, it's the velocity with which it's being democratized, especially uh, through open source. That's really been staggering. feels like every week there's some new announcement um, that talks about a new model or new uh, technique that lowers the barrier for regular organizations in order to be able to leverage these technologies. So as a consequence, I think, whereas just a few years ago, there was pretty healthy skepticism about the degree to which different industries are going to be able to apply AI. I think at this point, it's pretty broadly accepted that every industry will be using AI. And this is already, this change is already happening. You know, a recent Gartner poll found that over 70% of organizations are actively exploring Gen AI, with one in five putting things into use already. Now at Databricks, we found that the number of customers putting ML models into production have quadrupled year over year. So this is happening as we speak. So what is getting in the way though? What is preventing um, organizations from simply trying things to actually getting value or even you know leading their industry? And while I think it, while everyone is right now focused on being able to access the latest foundational models or being able to have you know, acquire access to GPUs. I think it's quite clear if you look at the trajectory of where we're going that those capacity issues and those access issues are gonna be, be resolved, right? Smaller models, for example, from more providers are just gonna become available. And, you know, GPU capacity issues are gonna be addressed, you know, you know as NVIDIA ramps up production or, or as new types of uh, silicone uh, uh, become available. And I think pretty soon everyone's going to find that it will come down to the data. Um, certainly 72% of executives agree through a survey that MIT ran. Uh, you know, it, it stands to reason, right? Like if everyone has access to modeling technologies um, and everyone has access to uh, capacity, compute capacity, then the, the only difference between a failed AI project and a working one and the industry market leading one um, is really going to come down to the data that's that an organization uses to feed these models. Because ultimately, good models can't overcome bad data. And that's why I think more than anyone, you know, data engineers and data teams more broadly are going to end up being the true heroes and enablers of the AI revolution that we're currently going through. You know, the ones that's going to be creating, managing and operating the data pipelines and platforms that are really gonna power uh, the Gen AI revolution and differentiate the organizations that you work for. So the question is, how do you prepare for this new challenge? What do you do to make sure that your data platforms and your systems um, and your team is up to the challenge? And I have cr three quick thoughts that I wanna share in this lightning talk um, on this front. The first idea is really just to plan for scale much, much larger scale. Now, I think everyone, including those who don't work in data, knows that data volumes are just growing very, very rapidly. You know, you can see this in your own uh, personal cloud usage, for example. But I think for people who know it, who work in data, they, they recognize that this growth is happening far more quickly in the, inter in the inter enterprise than um, within the consumer space. And I think with the Gen AI revolution, one of the things that you need to account for is the rise of synthetic data, which is really going to amplify um, the pace of growth even more. Uh, Gardner is making some pretty bold predictions on this front, but perhaps I'll start by just uh, explaining what do I mean by synthetic data? Well, synthetic data is really artificial generated, art artificially generated data. And this stands in contrast with the bulk of data that we currently process in data systems, which is really data that, you know, are obtained from direct measurements, right? Um, 
data that you capture through your business systems or through your machine data. Increasingly, as we apply Gen AI technologies, there's going to be data that's generated by AI models, which you also need to capture and evaluate and process and, in, and possibly even use to train and um, you know, fine tune more uh, models. And so as a consequence of uh, this kind of new vector of data growth, Gartner is making some pretty bold predictions about how data volumes will grow and you know, uh, specifically synthetic data taking a larger and larger portion of it. And ultimately what this means is uh, today is that you need to have a plan for that much larger scale. And so every step along the way, as you're making technology choices, you need to choose technologies that are capable, not only of just scale, being able to scale to those volumes, but also being able to scale to those volumes uh, efficiently, right? Um, cost differences on compute, for example, will really exaggerate themselves as you increase scale. The second idea um, related to the first is, well, while you're planning for scale, you really don't want to do this at the cost of fragmenting your data landscape and fra fragmenting your system landscape. What do I mean by this? Well, today, the reality is that most organizations who have reached um, a scale where they have to start processing larger volume data have what we call the bifurcated data stack. They usually have some type of data warehouse that's needed to support business intelligence workloads and reporting and dashboarding. But they also have a separate system that's capable of large, handling much larger volumes um, that's lake-based. And ultimately what this bifurcation means for data engineers is that data is split between these two worlds and a ton of work is made much more complicated. You have to replicate data back and forth. Sometimes you have to build pipelines redundantly or um, possibly you risk um, having you know, differences in, 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 the, in the answers that you get out of two different systems. And when you compound the fact that you have these dual uh, systems, the dual stacks with dual um, parallel logic and parallel pipeline, and you multiply it by the emergence of new personas that need to use data that comes with AI workloads. I'm talking about like people like ML engineers and data scientists, you end up with a really complicated data landscape to manage, um, manage and, and govern. It becomes a little bit of a spider web. And that's why at Databricks, we really, we really think it's important to unify your data stack in and to build it up, uh, under one and to be able to build it and, and, and run it as one unified platform with one unified governance layer. You know, we, we call that concept the lake house and it's really been in, embraced by the rest of the industry. We think this unified uh, data stack with a unified governance layer is really the foundation upon which you can build everything else. Um, without it, you're going to end up managing this platform and, and not not only doubling your efforts, but you know, uh, com making it much much more uh, complicated as you scale because of the spider webbing effect that I, I mentioned a moment ago. So unifying and simplifying your day landscape is really a, a, a key part to being prepared for the um, for the AI age. And the last thought uh, I'd like to, to end this talk with is really the idea of selecting open solutions. Now, given that I'm speaking at an, an Airbytes event, this is probably preaching to the choir. I think the key thing to, 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 to that I'm trying to share is that Having a unified stack as what I, 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 I'm pushing for a moment ago, it really doesn't have to come at a cost of having an open stack. There are now data platforms and stacks that are both unified and open. They use standards that prevent you from being locked in. These stacks are multi-cloud. They store data in open data formats. They use standards for modeling um, as opposed to proprietary um, modeling technology. And they allow you to switch um, between different type of AI model providers or even AI modeling approaches. You know, as, as we've seen recently in the news, you can, if your entire AI strategy is vendor specific, um, you leave yourself exposed to some pretty, uh, some, some things that are pretty difficult to anticipate. In anticipate. 
Now, this idea of having an open stack is, um, it's not that controversial. And, and I, I think it's pretty popular now. In fact, I think if you talk to every vendor, they will claim some, uh, some or all of the above so that they can claim that they're open. So the question really is like, how can you tell the difference between a vendor that is truly open from one that simply claims to be? And I think it's actually not that hard to, to figure it out. And you can probably do it in three with three simple questions. The first question you can ask is like, when a vendor claims they're open is, do they actually have a credible history of embracing open standards? Or perhaps have they historically made a show of simply embracing standards, but instead have embraced and extinguished? Or um, have, do they have a history of creating proprietary protocols um, and languages when standard ones exist. Another question you can ask is, you know, if they are claimed to be using an open standard or uh, or be part of an open source project, are they actually active in contributing to that standard or project? And finally, uh, you, it, for, for vendors that claim to have an open solution, you can look to their customer use cases uh, to see are there real world usages of their open of the open variant of their solution, or is it simply just a claim um, for PR? So that was pretty much it for my talk. There's three simple thoughts on how uh, data teams can prepare themselves for the AI age. You need to plan for a much larger scale. You should simplify and unify your data landscape, and you should choose open solutions and be critical uh, about uh, which vendor that you go with. Uh, that claims that openness. So as a parting thought, uh, maybe a bit of a reminder, you know, in the AI age, it's ultimately going to be your data that sets your AI apart. And that's why data engineers are going to end up being the true heroes of the AI age. Thanks.